Welcome everybody to uh, today's session on marketplace technology. Uh, honored to be here at the MDM Shift uh, 2023, and we're going to talk about how this applies to the B2B distribution world. And going to break the presentation into four sections: what, why, and how. Uh, and we'll have some Q and A at the end. So ten minutes for what, ten minutes for why, and most of the topic will be about the technology and how you implement a marketplace as a distributor. So first, what, dis what disruption is going on? Why is it so disruptive? Which we'll talk about the uh, business model underlying marketplaces, the platform and concepts, and how is really the business implementation as well as the uh, technology stack. You know, we're, we're here to talk about technology. We're not gonna be looking at programming code or anything at that level of depth of technology, but looking at the business uh, aspects. So uh, just a background. If you don't get enough marketplace here, we've got a, about a 500 page book for free at our booth. Stop by our booth outside the uh, main hall. Um, it was an Amazon bestseller on marketplaces. And just one slide about McFadden, then we're gonna get into about uh, 50 slides on uh, marketplace technology. So McFadden Digital, we've been building um, large scale enterprise e-commerce and marketplace solutions. We've served over 10% of the Fortune 500, lots of mid-sized, mid-market uh, uh, distributors, manufacturers, and retailers across many different uh, industries and really scaled pretty much every dimension you can consider large scale uh, in e-commerce and marketplaces. We do a lot of thought leadership from you know 500 page books to white papers. We'll talk about some additional educational resources available to you. Um, members of the Mock Alliance as well. We're gonna talk about some of these actual resources here in the session. And we've been doing this a long time. Uh, over a third of a century in digital transformation, enabling our clients uh, 25 years, quarter century, building out e-commerce. And that's core to what we've been doing. We still do this and we do a lot of e-commerce. Uh, happy to talk to you about e-commerce. Today's session is about Marketplace, which we've been building out for about 15 years now. And we have 300 professionals in e-commerce and Marketplace around the world. Onshore teams, uh, nearshore teams in Brazil, offshore teams in India, and a European uh, team as well. So that's about McFadden. Like that. On to the educational part of our uh, topic, which is be starting with what disruption our marketplace is causing in the distribution world. Uh, pretty much every analyst out there, I'm not going to read all these to you, you'll get the copies of these slides, but from Forrester saying 63% of e-commerce happens on marketplaces to internet retailer, 92% of people shop on marketplaces. Gartner says that 15% uh, of all uh, organizations that have a high GMV, high gross margin, gross merchandise value, uh, commerce platform will run their own marketplaces. Again, we're mostly talking about running your own marketplace, not so much the seller side. Uh, global marketplace is reaching three and a half trillion dollars of, of sales, growing at 20%. Digital Commerce 360, uh, we'll talk about a lot of stats from them, uh, growing at 29% top line. We, we heard uh, earlier about uh, McKinsey's estimate that the some of the better distributors are gaining one to 2% uh, sales growth. Um, of course, GMV and Marketplace is growing at 29% to uh, almost $3 trillion. Uh, Marketplace Pulse, you know, the companies that are buying these uh, Marketplace sellers are raising a billion dollars a month, or we're raising a billion dollars a month. It's changed a little bit now, but you know, the aggregators that roll up uh, B2B sellers, huge industry. Again, going through some of the stock market changes right now. Uh, most of Amazon sales, sales come through their, their Marketplace. Um, and they collected $117 billion in fees from marketplace sellers. Uh, we'll talk about the difference between fees versus GMV, your top line sales. They're adding a new seller every minute. Can you imagine onboarding a new supplier as a distributor every minute? Uh, that's the scale at which marketplaces operate. So we'll talk about how that happens from the business and the technology side. Uh, digital Commerce 360 did some analysis and of the digital sales for marketplaces, mar for e-commerce, sorry, digital commerce for distributors, uh, marketplaces is the fastest growing segment. So we see on the far right here you know, what the digital uh, uh, B2B commerce sales have been from 1.3 trillion growing up to 1.9 trillion in total sales. But the percentage of that that's going through marketplaces, you know, uh, several years ago it was just 1.8%. Last year it was 6.9%. Uh, so that's 130% growth. Again, compare that to the typical uh, distributor growth, McKinsey was talking about 1% to 2%. Uh, that's more than doubling. Uh, Accenture also has some stats on this. They expect it to market, oh, okay. expect marketplaces to be 30% uh, of all digital digital sales. Their numbers are 5%, so slightly different, but 
you know, all these analysts are saying it's fast, it's big, it's growing, and it's going to get much, much bigger. And you compared to the pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and post-pandemic, hopefully we're post-pandemic, uh, marketplaces have been growing at a much faster rate than e-commerce. There's some data from Miracle, one of the marketplace vendors. Uh, at least double, last year marketplace growth was 6x uh, the e-commerce growth of 100 companies that they surveyed. Uh, Digital Commerce 360 said that within the, the, e the distribution market, uh, 7x growth, faster growth of marketplace sales over e-commerce sales. So it can solve a lot of different problems. Uh, Adam from our team presented this uh, fairly quickly during the uh, main track today. So three main areas, you can improve productivity with the marketplace, and this can be onboarding uh, sellers more quickly. I mentioned Amazon doing one per minute. Uh, the traditional process we've seen many distributor clients in the e-commerce world take one, two, three or more months to onboard a new seller from vendor sourcing to contract negotiation to ERP um, ingestion of catalog information and enhancing the merchandising description of the products and so forth. Um, you do that with marketplaces fairly easily within a day, a couple days, a week, uh, probably the max on most of the onboarding of sellers. Digitizing operations, we know a lot about that we've been talking today. Uh, McKinsey mentioned how Bundle had done two, has done 200 acquisitions uh, in the last 30 years, I think it was. Can you imagine having to do all those ERP integrations, having to ingest all those catalogs, harmonize the data? With the marketplace, Bunzel uh, quickly can add those acquisitions into their core marketplace offering and instead of having to do a new IT project to transition and merge multiple commerce platforms. Uh, inventory terms, we'll talk about 1P versus 3P and how quickly you can move inventory with a marketplace or a dropship model. And we'll talk about dropship and marketplace and the difference between those. Better real-time inventory visibility, uh, and talked about parts in town. Uh, 3M, we had a presentation with our client 3M about this, uh, how manufacturers bring distributors into their distribution channel via a marketplace. So it's not disintermediating or moving the distributor as a middleman, it's channel collaboration, bringing the distributors into the marketplace so that the distributors need the fulfillment, even though the manufacturer operates a marketplace, uh, does the sale, but the distributor still gets the revenue, gets the customer relationship, gets to fulfill the product. Uh, Store to, if you have a counter sales, you can integrate that into your solution as well. Circular economy tying in the, we're seeing a lot of regulatory compliance issues coming down, starting in Europe, coming more into the US about traceability of goods and uh, being able to recycle them for sustainability and, and other reasons from, again, regulatory compliance to investor and customer uh, demands around uh, sustainability and ESG goals. Quickly, category, quickly expanding into other categories. Category expansion is one of the main reasons a lot of organizations will, will implement a marketplace. The ability to quickly go into new categories adjacent or totally different than what you're, what you're selling. Uh, and the cross, cross sell, upsell, substitute sell. If you're out of stocks, you may as well have a marketplace seller keep your sale, uh, save our sale with a, with a uh, substitute product from a marketplace seller. So let's look at the buyer viewpoint. This is again another survey that Digital Commerce 360 did. So these are the percentage of uh, buying that B2B buyers do on marketplaces. The top uh, part there is, uh, do you do 75% or more of your buying on a marketplace? And 9.2% of respondents said that. And then you see down to 50%. So a third of B2B buyers are buying from marketplaces. Shouldn't you have a marketplace? That's a pretty amazing stat, just how many buyers are buying from marketplaces. Good question. That's what we're going to get into uh, in the next section. The, the what uh, or the, uh, is a marketplace. So um, it's a platform business model and compare the platform to a pipeline. I've got a whole bunch of slides to answer that question. It's a very good question. That's, that's a whole next section. <laughs> uh, and uh, the number of market BD marketplaces, there are 500 of them now. So uh, DC360 has a pretty good uh, top 500 report on uh, all the BD marketplaces. So there are a lot of them out there. There was only 70 uh, four years ago. Everybody's seen the graph of how quickly Amazon business is growing in seven years, um, growing to 35 billion, uh, forecasting to grow to 80 billion dollars a year. Uh, and if you look at your know, growth rate, we're talking about one to two percent sales growth in distribution. They're growing at about 50 percent per year uh, in the past seven or eight years here. Uh, and this is just their their top line sales in their B2B. 
in, if you include B2C, it's close to half a trillion dollars of top line sales that, that Amazon processes. Alibaba in China is doing similar, you know, 29% growth. So these marketplaces are really growing quickly and they provide lots of different revenue streams. So in Amazon, you know, the first party sales, the, the, again, the top line, uh, this is, this is uh, owned inventory that they stock and they fulfill like a traditional e-commerce seller. The second line there, the $117 billion is the fees, the commissions they charge, the FBA fulfilled by Amazon, revenue that they get. There are a lot of different fees in which a marketplace um, uh, monetizes their, uh, their, their sales. Again, this is, fees are different than GMV, top line GMV. So you notice that 220 plus 117 don't add up to half a billion, half a trillion. Uh, that's because the top line sales is not necessarily considered revenue. The commissions and the fees that you charge, that's what's considered revenue. And in a separate meeting, we can talk about uh, the different financial model of marketplaces. We're here to talk about market technology. Advertising or retail media has become a big area in, uh, in marketplaces, subscription models as well. Uh, and they have brick and mortar sales as well. Surprisingly getting close to $20 billion for Amazon. But that's a horizontal market and not everybody wants to become Amazon. In fact, we don't recommend people try to become Amazon. We recommend going into a vertical and I'll talk about lots of examples of that. Uh, our clients and others that have offerings in unique niches and you know, some of this data from Bessemer Ventures shows the, the opportunity, you know, half trillion, trillion dollar segments where there's a lot of opportunity to launch a, a marketplace that is not a competitor to Amazon. It's very focused on a specific business solution. And the amount of investment funds that are going into these uh, vertical marketplaces is huge as well. You see over a um, billion dollars in some, but hundreds of millions of dollars of investment going into some of these vertical marketplaces. And they're doing good amounts of revenue as well uh, from over a, a, a billion dollars of uh, online GMB, top line revenue, to many of these different uh, marketplaces, B2B marketplaces, are doing in the hundreds of millions of dollars of, of top line revenue with a marketplace solution. Uh, we see this in the brands as well. So uh, if you look at this graph, this bubble graph on the bottom axis, we have uh, years in business. The vertical axis is the number of employees. Uh, you, you know, the traditional uh, CPG brands, and this, this applies to others, uh, that have been around for 100 to 100, 200 years that have 100,000 employees and they have 90 or 300 brands. These aggregators I mentioned uh, I've been rolling up buying the sellers on marketplaces at a rapid pace. Some of them, like uh, Thrasher, have been were buying a seller, buying a new brand every week. That's how quickly they were growing. There was you know, twelve billion dollars that were invested into these aggregators. It slowed down a lot, but there were a lot of these, almost a hundred of these aggregators uh, that have been buying up. And and if I was a brand manufacturer, I'd worry about all these companies growing up uh, quickly and selling on marketplaces uh, and becoming competitors in certain areas. Uh, you've probably seen the Amazon flywheel. You know, Jeff Bezos got this from um, um, uh, one of the business consultants, not Porter. Uh, Tim, Jim Collins. Jim Collins uh, kind of gave this idea to uh, to Jeff Bezos. You know, the idea is uh, you get more traffic, you get a bigger selection by having more sellers. You provide a better customer experience, it drives more traffic, and then more sellers want to sell in your marketplace. And then you have a bigger selection, and then that, that inner flywheel keeps spinning. Uh, and as you get more, more sellers come on and they start competing, they start uh, competing on price and lowering the price. You know, the, the goal of Jeff Bezos, you heard also mentioned yesterday, is to lower their prices, not to raise their prices and have lower cost structure and again, improve the customer experience and drive that whole flywheel. We have a similar uh, flywheel. I'm not going to read through all this. It's in some of our documentation if you want to read through that or, or it's in the uh, you get a copy of the slides, but again, more products, drives more customers, drives more sales, drives more profits. Uh, you recruit more sellers, suppliers, vendors for your, for your marketplace, collect more data, and the data is really important. I'll talk about that in a sec. And if you have you know, counter sales, you can drive there, drive more assortment in, or the right uh, data-driven assortment in your, and your counter sales, as well as drive more traffic to those, those brick-and-mortar locations. So that was the what. Uh, let's move on to why. Get back to your question about what is a marketplace? Why are marketplaces different? And, and what makes a marketplace different than e-commerce? So it's really the, the fundamental you know, academic difference is a pipeline business versus a platform business. Uh, about a decade ago, these uh, uh, college professors wrote this excellent book called Platform Revolution. And their definition is, you know, platforms are multi-sided ecosystems with a nexus of rules that drive positive scaling network effects. 
there's a lot of kind of mumbo jumbo, but let me let me explain those things in uh, uh, kind of more uh, understandable terms, and I'll talk about them now. So the the pipeline business. Let's uh, look at this. this is traditional distribution. It's traditional retail. You force first have to source products from manufacturers. Um, it can may come from other from wholesalers. We have to negotiate contracts. I said this process in itself. These first few steps may take a couple months for distributors we've seen. Load that data into your ERP, which may be in your cryptic you know, 40 or 80 character product description. You have to merchandise that, take photographs, um, write SEO optimized text that's going to des describe it, perhaps in your, your industry application of that product from that manufacturer. You as the seller set the price, as the uh, uh, distributor set the price for the end customer, or you have uh, contract pricing. You hold the inventory both physically and financially. You have to outlay capital to buy the goods, and you have to build out the distribution centers, fulfillment centers to hold to hold that the, that good. Process the orders, and this is typically automated in most digital commerce platforms, and then fulfill the orders uh, to finally get cash from the customer. So eight sequential labor-intensive activities that you have to do uh, that scale linearly. If you want to double your uh, number of products, you need to double the number of uh, vendor negotiation contracts you support, you need to double your number of merchandisers, you need to double your uh, distribution center space, you need to double your, your fulfillment system, fulfillment network, and so forth. It, it scales linearly, it has to double. Now a marketplace, on the other hand, is a platform business. So you have a fewer set of team members in there, and again, this can work in parallel with your e-commerce operations, but uh, some people to recruit sellers, uh, this can eventually get automated. You know, with Amazon, they, they uh, have highly automated that. You support those sellers in, in their uh, onboarding products and, and with orders and so forth. And processing orders is, is uh, again, automated, but still a step in the process. So what makes this really different and unique and the more of an exponential or logarithmic uh, scaling route is the network. So if you think of like Facebook or other social networks or telephone networks, if you have uh, 12 nodes and you add a a 13th node, it's not adding, you know, whatever that is, 0.8% um, or 8%. It's adding a whole other 12 network connections in there. So it's more of a logarithmic um, math equation as that scales. More sellers, more buyers, and it's a, 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 a logarithmic or, or sorry, exponential growth on that. You still have customers on the other side, but your suppliers and sellers uh, on the opposite side uh, could be, you know, one reseller that's sourcing from a wholesaler or distributor. Uh, reseller might source from multiple distributors or wholesalers. Um, but what where it really gets interesting is you have multiple sellers that are offering the same product and they start competing on price. Uh, so that drives down the price. That's what Amazon does. Uh, some in the B2, many B2B implementations or marketplaces, you don't want to do this. You want to maintain pricing. So uh, like Toyota Material Handling, when they have a, their marketplace, they want to maintain MSRP from their distributors selling at that. So you don't have to necessarily drive down prices, but that's the business model that many marketplaces operate on. You as a distributor may be sourcing from multiple manufacturers or manufacturers may uh, supply goods directly onto the marketplace as well. So the important part here is that, that network effect, which drives exponential growth uh, and outsourcing a lot of that activity. So it's the third party sellers that are sourcing goods, they're negotiating contracts, they're um, loading the, the product information in. They're doing the merchandising, the SEO optimization of the text. They're setting the price, they're holding the inventory, and they're doing the fulfillment. So you outsource six of those eight activities uh, in that pipeline into a parallel process. So it reduces your costs, makes you much more nimble, gives you the ability to scale much more quickly. Um, so that's a pipe. That's a comparing commerce to uh, marketplace. And in between, we have dropshipping. So people ask, where does dropship fit into all this? It's still a, a pipeline business. You still have to do six of those eight activities. Only two of those steps fall, uh, fall out. So you'll have a third party that will hold the inventory. A lot of times the manufacturer, uh, and they will also fulfill those goods. So you don't have to outlay the capital. You don't have to um, necessarily ship it to the end customer. But you still have to find the goods, negotiate contracts, loading ERP, merchandise it's at the price, process the orders. All those activities are still on your shoulders. So what does this look like um, comparing these three? And, and we have a maturity model that uh, I'll talk about in a second, uh, how companies evolve. So first part of e-commerce is uh, traditional you know, pipeline business. You do those uh, eight activities we talked about. 
dropship has six of those activities, still linear pipeline process. Um, and the third party marketplace is where we get into that exponential scalability of the business. So looking at that as a graph, here in the horizontal axis, we see the, the cost, that capital, both in a you know, CapEx and OpEx, you know, how many fulfillment centers do you need to build? How many headcount do you need to staff in those fulfillment centers and, and in your trucking and in your merchandising team, et cetera? And the vertical axis is how big of a catalog can you scale? How much revenue can you drive? How much profit can you drive? So again, as I mentioned, uh, first party goods are linear. If you want to double your inventory, you want to double your um, SKU count, you need to double your fulfillment centers, double your merchandising staff, et cetera, linear. Dropship is a little bit more efficient and you don't need to necessarily double your fulfillment center if you add more dropship products. But third party marketplace is where it really scales exponentially. It may not make sense to do marketplace at a very small, small scale uh, because your costs may not necessarily be more efficient than at a uh, larger organization. So we don't always recommend marketplaces for everybody. Uh, E-commerce may be you know, the best fit for, for many organizations. But talking about this marketplace maturity model, we've got this document out there. If you want to download it, um, URLs here, um, you get the slides, mcfadden.com slash MMM. But we talk about operator sourcing everything. Dropship is taking two of those steps out of that process. Marketplace, um, really it's the, you outsource the, the merchandising, the sourcing, the merchandising, the pricing, fulfillment, and sometimes even returns to the third party. If you're familiar with CMM, uh, capability maturity model or CMMI, uh, this is built on that same model. So quantitative management, when you start collecting so much data, we were talking a lot about analytics earlier in some of the sessions. Um, you can drive that you know, um, category optimization, decide that something you're keeping in inventory, it may make more sense to have a third party seller uh, fulfill it because it's seasonal or it's heavy, it's difficult to fulfill, um, the margins are low, uh, whatever reason. Or if you see highly profitable things that are third party sellers or something and you wanna keep in your fulfillment centers and your counter sales. Uh, you have that data to, to drive you know, the best assortment in your organization. Then optimizing might be you know, lots of different transformative solutions. You can add uh, services, for example, installation, repair, uh, services as a services marketplace, kind of like a Uber, Airbnb, DoorDash, Instacart, some of these services marketplaces, Fiverr, Upwork, in addition to selling products. So lots of ways of optimizing things. Again, there's a, lots of detail. Don't expect to read this, but it's in the, uh, the document here for lots more details. So how do you decide whether to keep something first party, uh, drop ship, or marketplace? So you've, they've seen the long tail model uh, where the horizontal axis is the number of unique products that somebody has. There may be real niche products at the far right of this graph. But then the far left is things you sell a lot of. They're fast movers and they're very popular. So usually that highly popular frequent fast movers will be owned inventory to your DC or FC. Dropship will be kind of in the interim and third party seller might make sense for some of those niche products that don't move fast. Another way of looking at that is, is kind of your cost to carry as well. So say there's a unique uh, generator or hydraulic or you know, pneumatic machine that you, that's heavy, it's difficult to ship, it's hazmat or whatnot. Um, that's hard to carry, you don't move a lot, it's hard to fulfill versus you know, a power drill, hand, hand drill. Easy to carry, easy to fulfill, high fast movers. Um, on the other axis, things that, uh, there may be a wide variety of integrated circuits or chips. Um, they're changing quite frequently and there are a lot of them. Uh, so you keep things easy to carry, easy to fulfill, low variety in stock, first party, drop ship, and then third party for those difficult to carry, difficult to fulfill, uh, high variety, fast moving, uh, or Fresh, frequently changing products. Uh, all right, so that was the why and what. I'm not sure if I answered the question about what a marketplace is. Uh, so this is very much from the marketplace owner side. Correct. With you know the the price of e-commerce, right? Just you know, just dropped through the floor. Right? You can to spin up an e-commerce site. What are the value drivers for the third parties? What do you have to do as, I guess what do you have to do as the marketplace owner to drive enough value for the third party that they're motivated to participate? Right? Because you're, you know, you're kind of, you know, the way I sort of read this is like, ship all the bad stuff off my balance sheet to them. <laughs> you know, and they just, they're just going to take it, right? <laughs> Good question. And, and uh, it goes back to a couple, couple answers to that, uh, a couple of points to answer that. And one is that, that flywheel uh, effect that attracts the sellers. So, 
if you are the a location where the buyers are buying, the sellers want to come to you so you can they get the eyeballs of your customers. That's the main reason is to, to grow to that scale. And I'll talk about a couple of our customers. Some are small, some are large that have unique offerings in their industry. So one's a uh, Chem Direct is a chemical distributor, and they add value to their suppliers, which are chemical manufacturers, sometimes not that you know, digitally sophisticated in their digital channels. They add insights, they add um, uh, white label storefronts for those um, suppliers that can sell directly to the, to the customers. They share customer data. Some marketplaces don't do that. Uh, Amazon is an example that they, they don't share much customer data with their sellers. Chem Direct does, and that's part of their value proposition is Hey, uh, Mr. Chemical Supplier, we will give you more data. We'll give you a digital channel to sell. We'll send lots of orders your way. Um, we'll uh, let you white label some of this. We'll give you industry insights into what's happening across the whole um, chemical distribution industry. So that's a good question. You have to attract both sides of the ecosystem. Everybody's been used to trying, how do I get more buyers, more customers? That's been the you know, millennia long <laughs> concern of retail and distribution is I want to get more buyers. Um, the flip side of running marketplaces, you need to also heavily recruit sellers to come uh, build up that critical mass of sellers and orders, and orders on your marketplace as an operator. Um, again, that's why a marketplace may not make sense for a smaller distributor. Um, perhaps just going the e-commerce route with first party held inventory makes more sense at, at a certain scale. Sure. Um, time. So I think we're kind of on time. So, now we're going to get into the technology section. I think we gave a good background on what a business model is, why it's so uh, so popular and trending so much. I'm going to start with a, more of a vendor agnostic, so this is not tied to any specific e-commerce platform, not tied to any specific marketplace platform, but it shows you the conceptual um, uh, data flow and architecture of the system. So customers on one side, on the top, sellers, vendors uh, on the suppliers on the bottom side, and the marketplace operator on the right side. So we have the traditional commerce, which is you know, your, your standard you know, catalog cart checkout that's been around for a quarter century. Um, uh, in lots of platforms here, we just saw big commerce uh, up here talking about their, their e-commerce engine, great, great platform. Lots of other e-commerce engines out there as well. Um, you'll have external systems, which may cover payment and tax. You know, it may vary by industry, whether tax applies. Uh, but there will be an admin console for managing the e-commerce e platform. Uh, merchandising, so managing the product descriptions and images, any promotions you might sell, sometimes it's more uh, retail focused, but content management, the images, if you have uh, MSDS sheets, whatnot, um, customer management order status reports, and so forth on the commerce engine. That's And the e-commerce engine is customer facing. The marketplace platform is seller facing. So in there, you also have an operator uh, console to manage the marketplace. And sometimes uh, both commerce and marketplace are combined in one platform. We'll talk about some of the vendors that do that. So the uh, marketplace operator console, you, know, you approve your vendors, your sellers uh, through that. Um, you can manage them, you can curate your categories, curate which products go in, uh, look at the third party order status, uh, configure shipping grids. So, if from this part of the country to that part of the country, it's going to be this time frame and that cost um, and so forth and, and types of reports and analytics. At the bottom here, you'll see a, a graphical user interface perhaps to the, to the uh, sellers, your suppliers. Uh, could be API calls, so some of the more sophisticated uh, suppliers, vendors will have uh, API interfaces. Or it could be a vendor aggregation network, a van, like Channel Advisor. There's also Feednomics out here, which is somewhat similar to that. Uh, that can help automate that onboarding of, of suppliers. So in that, the data flow, first the uh, sellers will upload their information into the marketplace and that they get a vendor page on the uh, marketplace. So you can see this is all about manufacturer A. Uh, you import their catalog as well, harmonize the data, which we'll talk a lot about. They have, they have different attributes, different descriptions, different uh, catalog structure, merge the two catalogs together. Uh, offers are actually Fast moving data, so it changes frequently. This could be the inventory, could be the price, could be the shipping time, uh, other factors like that that constantly in change that are constantly changing, which is different than the catalog. So the product description doesn't change that much, but inventory, pricing, uh, fulfillment times uh, will change frequently. Uh, as it gets added to a cart, you confirm the inventory and delivery. Uh, the 
the seller will sometimes will accept the order. This can be manual or automated most of the time. At large scale, it's an automated process through API calls. Uh, any payment and tax authorization happens sometimes. Uh, this can be, we've, seen, we've done a lot of implementations of balance, which is a BNPL buy now, pay later um, credit offering where marketplace can extend terms to customers and pay sellers more quickly. And so another uh, opportunity to make margin on a, on a marketplace. Order status from the seller again, uh, do the settlement of the, the payment uh, and a lot of messaging back and forth. So if there's a question from a customer to uh, uh, or buyer to the seller and you want to anonymize that so you're avoiding disintermediation or leakage, platform leakage, you have anonymized messaging, managing the performance of the rating and review of the sellers, how well are they answering questions, fulfilling on time, are their product descriptions accurate, running reports. So that's a generalized uh, um, marketplace architecture. Uh, we go into more technical details and then you know, we get into some more uh, very specific uh, vendor uh, architectures. And later we'll talk about some. So if you want to grab a, a poster here, if you go into a little more detail about one, this one is specific to Miracle, one of the marketplace platforms. And I'll talk about other marketplace platforms uh, right now. So how do you know which marketplace platform to use? You may already have you know, um, SAP Hybris or, or uh, IBM HCL Commerce or uh, Salesforce Commerce Cloud or Big Commerce or Adobe Commerce Magento or maybe Shopify or custom built uh, e-commerce platforms. But you want to extend and add a marketplace onto the commerce platform. How do you decide which one to use? Well, we're going to go back to that marketplace maturity model for this assessment. Uh, so looking at the first part of e-commerce, which is where um, all those commerce platforms like Big Commerce, et cetera, I mentioned would fall in. They do 1P commerce very well. Some of them do dropship. So you've got e-commerce platforms, you probably already have something in house, but then you want to add on the marketplace capabilities. And there's some pure play platforms, like I mentioned Miracle, we'll talk about some others. Uh, or there are full stack companies that provide e-commerce plus marketplace. This would be like a VTEX, Spreaker, uh, Virto Commerce, uh, the number of companies like this. And different uh, vendors uh, scale to different levels. Some are, you know, $10,000 options that are good for scaling to five or $10 million. Some of them are half a million dollars or a million dollar uh, licensing uh, fees that scale to a hundred million dollars of annual GMV. So uh, they're different scales and we have this report called the Sweet Spot Report. If you want to learn more about potential vendors, we talk about eight of them in here and some of them, uh, you know, go to the upper right with the, the very best uh, scalability, best features, but cost the most money six figures or seven figures sometimes, down to the lower end ones that are you know, uh, five figure uh, investments in the software and lots of options in between, some of which include commerce, some of which do not. So uh, uh, that full stack versus best of breed. Uh, you, again, we mentioned e-commerce and marketplace. Uh, so the, these eight vendors, some of them whom have you know, green or strong e-commerce, Spryker, Virto, uh, Vitex, uh, and others do not. Uh, most of them, well, everybody in this report has some marketplace capability. So the full stack companies uh, provide commerce and marketplace, and the point solutions tend to have a stronger marketplace capability, but no e-commerce. So the whole selection process of the technology stack um, has multiple factors that go into it. So again, download this report or grab a copy of it in our booth. Um, lots of details in there, about 30 pages or so of details on selecting a marketplace platform. We heard the phrase, uh, data is the new oil. Uh, and there's lots of plumbing in the, the technology implementation of a marketplace uh, that you have to do. So lots of these data pipes, some data comes from the e-commerce system, you know, you have AOV, conversion rate, abandonment, um, catalog information, buyer information. The marketplace has seller information. So you know, what's their acceptance rate, how they were handling returns. Um, analytics, typically have some web analytics or other uh, BI type tools internally that can be used for that. Your payment providers, it could be a balance, uh, for example, in the B2B credit term or credit queues out here, um, uh, offering information, lots of other systems that you pull data in. And you adjust it, harmonize it, visualize it, use predictive analytics and, and move forward with that. Talk a little bit about that stage of the maturity model. But from that, what do you do with that data? So you can curate your category expansion, your catalog, um, look at what you want to move from first party to third party or, or vice versa, something moving really fast as a third party seller bring it in-house. 
uh, help you recruit sellers. So you're doing well, uh, promote some or suspend them if they're not working well, looking at those commissions and street fees and how you optimize your, your fee structure to maximize both number of sellers, number of transactions and, and profit margin and optimizing your, your SEO, SEM marketing spend. So lots of plumbing, lots of data that can be really beneficial to you as a marketplace operator. And you may say, well, with that data, you've got this dashboard, all kinds of things like gross merchandise value, uh, monthly active users, your conversion rates, your uh, customer acquisition costs, all kinds of different analytics or metrics that you may be tracking on your, on your dashboard. And there are certain levers that you can pull on the seller facing side. So for your suppliers, yeah, how much are you recruiting them? How tightly are you curating what categories you're expanding to, what products they onboard? Uh, what's your commission fee structure? Is it high or low? Do you want to onboard a lot of sellers or try to maximize the per transaction commission? If you have advertising, how much are you charging for that? And then on the sellers, these are the traditional e-commerce levers. And how much are you spending on, on search engine mer uh, merchandising or paid, paid search ads? Uh, your, your B2B sales staff, other marketing activities, how much you're investing in a great user experience of B2B type capabilities and payment options like credit terms uh, on your marketplace. So lots of ways to tune the marketplace to optimize those, those capabilities. So on to the kind of the last section of the how. Uh, in this maturity model, we talk about the what, some examples we'll talk about here, and how. And we break that down into strategy, technology, and business. I'm going to talk more about the, the technology aspects here. Uh, so again, you'll get a copy of these slides with all this information on strategy decisions, business decisions, but the technology is where we're going to kind of focus today, the, the topic of this session. So some of the things are, are taxonomy. So you have your catalog attributes, your category structure, you have certain values that can be in there. Uh, your sellers or suppliers may have very different catalog structure attributes and values in there. So harmonizing that, making that work together, changing your UI. So you don't have just one price, you have the price of this seller, the price of that seller, the price of another seller. Uh, and when you add it into cart, you show the seller, we check out and maybe split it to multiple orders because it's gonna be different shipments for multiple sellers. So some of that technology that has to happen to get to be a, a third party marketplace. And then the quantitative management, we, we heard in some of the analytic sessions that move, that move from data to insights to predictive to prescriptive to automation. Now that's the, the next year really where you get the, the automation. So some strategy and business things, but again, looking at the technology, there's a, a lot of this data that can be ingested from the multiple systems uh, and automating some of these things like the, with that data, automating payments to, to the sellers, uh, doing reconciliation of this, um, some of the incentives that you can provide for sellers. And if, if they uh, become a four star or, or higher seller, they pay half a percent less commission on their deals. So lots of data that can optimize the business operations. And then in the op optimizing side, and then again on the technology side, a lot of different ways of diversifying or, or you know, reinventing your business. You can constantly be coming up with new business models. We see this with Amazon all the time. From single sign-on to different things, and maybe you have uh, regulatory compliance issues with state uh, controlled uh, hazmat or other alcohol, other elements, adding in CPQ capabilities that can pass RFQs directly down to your uh, suppliers through an automated system or punch out, uh, punch out, punch in capabilities, integrating into your, if you have a counter sales, integrating capabilities into the point of sale systems there. Uh, lots of ways in which you can enhance this. Uh, credit terms I mentioned, uh, uh, like, like Balance provides or, or Credit Safe offering that. Um, handling, automating some of the KYC, know your customer, know your business, uh, AML, anti money laundering requirements. Lots of ways in which you can automate a lot of these processes at the top tier. So that's from the evolution of commerce dropship, marketplace, quantitative uh, uh, management to optimizing. Let's look at it from a chronological order. There's certain things, and this is in the marketplace maturity model document as well. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the red areas too much, which is the business and strategy decisions, but focus more on these two bottom ones here in black, which are the technology topics of this, this track. So the build, uh, and deploy of the MVP, minimum viable product, and the platform enhancements. We'll talk about those two uh, chevrons on the next two slides. So build and deploy. Um, so you have certainly the, the setup of the environments. The taxonomy, again, is a import, very important upfront uh, data science activity of uh, harmonizing catalogs, how you're gonna do that. Integrations into tax. 
uh, depending on what segment you're selling or how you're selling, um, tax nexus is calculated by the seller's uh, state and nexus and county. So uh, tax calculation can be very different, again, depending on what you're selling and where you're selling. So that can be a separate, whole separate integration for the technology uh, element. I'm trying to speed up so we have some time left for questions here. Uh, and then as we get more advanced, we get into some uh, enhanced automations and seller onboarding, uh, better analytics, passing through promotions or coupons if you want to enable sellers to do that, uh, international expansion, cross-border shipping, um, and including uh, omni-channel if you do have counter sales. So now I'm going to talk about the last section here, which is uh, some sample. Uh, who is doing this? So I mentioned our client, Chem Direct, uh, their chemical distributor, close to half a million products. Uh, started several years ago, but scaled fairly quickly. Um, fast uh, uh, selling. They, this is where I mentioned they have advanced uh, um, supplier capabilities. So they enable their sellers with analytics, insights, uh, white labeling, um, trends in the industry. Logistics, yeah, the fulfillment capabilities. Uh, and in this case, it's a uh, uh, Adobe Commerce Cloud as a tech stack. And this, this stuff they've shared on their webinars with us in the past, so nothing proprietary here. Uh, with Webcool, one of the lower end, low cost uh, marketplace platforms. That's a, a mock uh, uh, solution here. We've got five mock uh, alliance platforms. Microservices, API, uh, uh, cloud-based headless um, solution. Uh, we do a lot of mock work, and we're one of the first members of the Mock Alliance. Uh, so a lot of these uh, vendors in here, Algolia, for example, uh, great search engine, um, uh, and it's a PWA progressive web app with view storefront on the front end. Meaning it responds like a uh, uh, a mobile app on your phone, but you don't need to write native iOS or Android code um, to work offline and, and have fast response and so forth. 3M, uh, we just gave a session on these guys. Uh, uh, month ago. Uh, they're a manufacturer, of course, not a distributor, but they are an example of bringing the distributors into the process. Uh, so here, the, the, a lot of manufacturers have the where to buy. So where can I buy this product? And they'll have a, a list of a dozen or dozens of uh, distributors or retailers where it can be bought. But they lose that customer interaction. They have no uh, insight into the sale. Um, whereas 3M has a here to buy. So you come to that site, you can buy it. And three distributors on this page are shown as potential method uh, uh, approaches to purchase the good. So it's a different flow. They maintain the customer relationship. They maintain the ability to um, have multiple items in the cart from multiple distributors, cross sell, build a relationship. They're more interested in, in the customer relationship and managing that as opposed to taking margin away from the distributors. The distributors set the price in this case. It's not them setting the price. And there are lots of diff different business models mentioned Toyota Material Handling, they stick with the MSRP because they want their distributors to hold that price up. Um, some may have a mat, minimum advertised price structure. So lots of ways to do that. This is a uh, HCL Commerce, the former uh, IBM Webster Commerce with Miracle, the high-end uh, leading marketplace platform for bigger enterprises with lots of other tools. Stripe, that we see as a common uh, B2C payment um, provider, in the, but also here in B2B as well. Uh, base supply. We did a webinar with a client base supply with MDM uh, two weeks ago, talking about their marketplace. This is a Magento Webcool balance as you know, credit uh, BMTL for the buyers and, and faster payment for the sellers. And Channel Advisor. I mentioned a vendor aggregation network where you can quickly onboard lots of sellers. They uh, scale uh, almost 10x their their SKU count from uh, 60,000 to 500,000 SKUs, uh, fasteners, nuts and bolts, etc. Planning to go to over a million in Q1 uh, with this marketplace. So, really fast growth there. Uh, one of our other clients, AB InBev, uh, this uh, application is in Latin America, but essentially it's a distributor, as everybody knows, for alcohol, uh, predominantly beer, but you can buy on this marketplace as a consumer, you can buy their beer, other uh, brewers' beer, um, other alcohol, uh, and they, in their marketplace, they have the, the retail operator, so it could be a, a bar, it could be a convenience store. Do, does the last mile fulfillment. Mm -hmm. This scaled from zero to half a half a billion dollars of online sales annually in five years. Uh, example of how quickly you can scale, um, kind of like a Drizzly here, the different uh, distribution models for alcohol in the U.S. than, than Latin America, uh, but opportunity to, to grow quite a, quite a bit there. 
So now we're going to get into Q&A, but let me just do a quick summary of what we talked about in the fire hose of content there. Uh, so what disruption has been happening? So Marketplace is the fastest growing uh, B2B di digital channel, over more than doubling every year, uh, and growing six to seven times faster than e-commerce, depending on which analysts you look at and listen to. There are now over 500 B2B marketplaces in production. Uh, Amazon is an example where they scaled to 35 billion in 10 years, at about 50 cent, 50 percent per year growth. Uh, lot, however, there are lots of opportunities in vertical markets uh, for different segments, like we've talked about fasteners, chemicals, alcohol, um, personal safety for 3M. Uh, and these companies tend to have a higher GMV, higher corporate valuation, faster growth. Uh, most of the metrics that we saw McKinsey talk about earlier are realized in these marketplaces. Why is the marketplace so disruptive and what's, what makes it different? The underlying business model difference is the pipeline versus platform. We talked about that. The linear versus exponential growth, the flywheel and network effects, um, the scalability, linear versus exponential, that the math that makes a difference. Very asset light, less capital, less time, less employees. So don't need the big investment in fulfillment center, distribution centers, uh, so, uh, fulfillment services, trucks, headcount in, in merchandising or in the warehouse. Uh, Lots of different business applications that slide at eight different business applications that marketplaces fulfill. And lots of this is in the maturity model. And how can you run it? Uh, those steps are also here in the marketplace enablement steps. You can either buy you know, a marketplace platform and bolt it onto your existing e-commerce platform, or you can get one platform that combines the two together, commerce plus marketplace. You have to manage both sides, both manage the sellers and recruit the sellers and make an attra attractive um, business environment for the sellers to come on board. You can combine dropship in there or use that as a stepping stone to get towards marketplace. Uh, and we talked about some example uh, production architectures uh, at the end of the presentation. There. So I'm not sure how much more time I have left, but uh, I'll open up the Q&A and I can finally stop talking. <laughs> I have a quick question. Yes. Do you have any marketplaces that are shipping to uh, like a central DC first for their quality inspections or anything like that before they go out to a customer? Yeah, the cross uh model. There are some do, that do that. A lot of them are in the uh, B2C space. Uh, I was just talking about one in the B2B space recently. But uh, an example of that, where that really makes a lot of sense, is in the uh, when you provide validation services. So there are some, um, retail, like the Real Real or some of these uh, sites that sell used clothing. Or uh, for sneakerheads, there's not many, but people spend thousands of dollars buying a pair of sneakers that want the authentic Air Jordans from whatever year, GOAT and StockX are example marketplaces that sell validated authentic sneakers uh, or other products that they authenticate. Uh, so there is that capability where there's, there's the value add service. The seller still sets the price, the seller um, still ships it, but it, it does go to the central uh, location and then it goes out to the end customer. So some, some different elements of that, that those business models I explained Sometimes you do them, sometimes you don't have to do them. But crosstalk is, is used, and I have another uh, B2B example. Yes, uh, good point. So Amazon's FBA fulfilled by Amazon for their B2B marketplace. Uh, Walmart does it as well with uh, Walmart Fulfillment. I forgot what they call their company plus, uh, uh, where Walmart does a similar thing to FBA. Uh, so the, the marketplace operator does the fulfillment. And that's part of the $117 billion a year that uh, Amazon collects is from that fulfillment service. So just to give some perspective on how Amazon collects money, the Marketplace Pulse did a, uh, a study and noticed that, uh, or calculated that about half of every dollar that, that goes to a Amazon seller um, goes to, uh, 50 cents out of every dollar that you spend on a product from a third party seller on Amazon, only half of it goes to the seller. Which sounds exorbitant and usurpery that that, that much stuff goes to, that much goes to, to the seller. But in the retail world, that seller is paying for advertising, which they would probably pay somewhere else to Google or Bing or, or other channels of advertising that goes to the fulfillment, which they would have to pay shipping and, or 3PL or their own fulfillment costs. It goes towards the, the transaction fees, which they would have to pay anywhere, uh, somewhere anyway. So um, it's obviously a lot of a lot of margin there across those three things. Now, 
B2B distribution margins are much, much thinner than retail margins are. So commission structures tend to be a lot lower. I mean, just sort of continuing on that thought, like are there any sort of sweet spots for margin profiles that work better in this model? It depends on the uh, industry and the category. Uh, so we've seen, like I mentioned in uh, chemical distributions, the, the margins and markups on some categories uh, has been <laughs> 5x, I think we heard in some of the, 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 the categories. And the same product may cost 10 times as much being sold to, let's say, a food beverage um, producer versus somebody who's doing you know, industrial manufacturing you know, as a cleaning chemical agent or whatnot. So uh, um, the margins really, really very well. If it's just moving a commodity box, it's very slim margins, typically, in, usually in the single digits uh, that are in, in retail, you'll typically see. Uh, 10, 15, 20%. But uh, if it's a commodity uh, product and B2B distribution, it tends to be in the single digits, sometimes low single digits. Good question. Other, other questions? I think we're actually right at our time. I think, oh, but one more. Any thoughts about like critical mass in terms of number of vendors to typically be successful with product count? Yeah, so uh, what's a good scale for success KPIs? And those are some of the, the targets when we typically go in for a strategy engagement is defining what are success criteria. Um, and usually we see you know, a, a good uh, start for the MVP is probably at least several dozen uh, marketplace sellers, ideally 50 to 100 third-party sellers. And, the, and again, it's going to be very dependent on the, the category that you're selling in. Uh, 50,000 to 100,000. Uh, now, some of them, like uh, we launched a product with a, a food distributor and we brought on KE, which is a specialty food products, and they added 50,000 or 75,000 products as one seller. So it's usually good to mix some specialty third party sellers that have unique products that can only get from them and others that are used to doing this a lot. They sell on other marketplaces and they can quickly add tens of thousands of products and SKUs because they have the highly structured data that's easy to ingest and bring into your marketplace. It depends. Again, so fasteners, you know, half a million fasteners going to a million fasteners. They're small, um, discreet, and easy to, uh, maybe not easy to, to manage, but uh, can be very uh, unique in that area. Um, some of the major, uh, you know, generic uh, uh, you know, Home Depot or HD Supply is probably not going to carry half a million or a million fasteners. That's where an example of a highly vertical uh, solution that can carry a high skew count within their category can have a unique differentiator. I think that does take us to time, though. I think uh, we're at 3.30. All right. Well, thank you very much for attending. Uh, <laughs>